To truly understand the history of America, one must know about the service, sacrifice, and pride of New York's famous 69th Regiment. To truly appreciate the history of the 69th, one must know about its people, traditions, and culture. Its people have been and continue to be outstanding. Its traditions span more than 150 years and will last for generations to come. Its culture is interwoven with its home, New York City. Like New York, the 69th continues to evolve. It is living, breathing, growing. If you are visiting the 69th's landmark armory or simply want to know more about the regiment's amazing history, listen closely. If you are a new member of the 69th, you are now part of something bigger and more lasting than yourself or any one person. You are now part of the unique story of the Fighting 69th. Wear your DUI with pride. Waterford is Ireland's oldest city. Thomas Francis Marr has always been a popular figure here, in Waterford County and the southeast of Ireland. But it hasn't been until recently that events started taking place in Waterford city centre to officially commemorate one of Waterford's most famous citizens. On the day Thomas Francis Marr presented the tricolour flag in Dublin, William Smith O'Brien, the leader of the Young Irelanders, called for raising an Irish brigade in New York City and training that brigade in the New York State Militia, today's National Guard. Within weeks, independent Irish companies were formed, which evolved into three Irish regiments. By the 1840s, mandatory militia service had gone away. Instead, the states relied upon volunteer militia companies. And these units became quite popular in the 1840s and the 1850s, and they are truly the beginnings of the volunteer military system that we have today with the National Guard. The 69th Infantry Regiment traces its lineage and early history to these three regiments, all located in Manhattan. In 1854, the three regiments were called the Irish Brigade of the New York Militia. One of the underlying purposes of the 69th Regiment was a training ground for those immigrants that hoped one day to return to Ireland and fight for their liberty from the British. In the fall of 1849, Michael Corcoran left Ireland, came to New York, and enlisted in the 69th Regiment as a private. He had been a revenue officer in Ireland, but at the same time, he was a member of a rural guerrilla group known as the Ribbon Men. Corcoran enforced tax laws during the day, but at night, he harassed landlords by killing their livestock and burning their barns. Corcoran was six foot two, which made him easily recognizable. When he came under suspicion for seditious activity, he decided to leave Ireland and travel to New York City. By 1860, he was in command of the 69th Regiment as its colonel. In 1860, Queen Victoria sent the young Prince of Wales on a state tour of Canada. He was invited to visit New York, and the state ordered a parade on October 11th in his honor. Corcoran refused to march with the regiment. Because of his refusal, charges were brought against him. Corcoran, now the hero of both the Irish community and the regiment, was presented with the first of its green flags, known as the Prince of Wales flag. Corcoran's court-martial continued until April 1861, when the Confederates fired on Fort Sumter. 
The court-martial was dissolved, and Corcoran led the 69th Regiment in the first major battle of the Civil War, the Battle of Bull Run. During that battle, the 69th carried the Prince of Wales flag. Corcoran was captured at Bull Run and would spend a year in Confederate prison. Thomas Francis Marr, as acting major, led the regiment home. On his way to New York, Marr met with President Lincoln and asked him to form an Irish brigade. Lincoln agreed and promoted Marr to Brigadier General. Marr was appointed commander of the Irish Brigade. The Irish Brigade carried the 69th's two other green flags, the first and second Irish colors. The 69th second Irish color was presented by President Kennedy to the Irish Parliament in 1963. The colors can still be seen today at the Leinster House, seat of the Irish Parliament in Dublin, Ireland. The Irish Brigade was led into battle on that occasion by Brigadier General Thomas F. Ma, who had participated in the unsuccessful Irish uprising of 1848, he was captured by the British and sent in a prison ship to Australia from whence he finally came to America. In the fall of 1862, after serving with distinction and gallantry in some of the toughest fighting of this most bloody struggle, the Irish Brigade was presented with a new set of flags. In the city ceremony, the city chamberlain gave them the motto, the Union, our country, and Ireland forever. Their old ones having been torn to shreds by bullets in previous battles, Captain Richard McGee took possession of these flags on December 2nd in New York City and arrived with them on the Battle of Fredericksburg and carried them in the battle. Today, in recognition of what these gallant Irishmen and what millions of other Irish have done for my country and through the generosity of the fighting 69th, I would like to present one of these flags to the people of Ireland. Upon returning from the Battle of Bull Run, many of the soldiers in the 69th Regiment New York State Militia, similar to today's National Guard, joined the newly formed 69th Infantry Regiment, New York State Volunteers, which was a federal regiment. The federal regiment was the first regiment of Mars Irish Brigade, and it fought in all the major battles of the Civil War. We shall march to the top, give them two volleys, and then go in with the bayonet. The color bearers were killed, and their flags fell. Most of the men in the front rank fell. The regiment reeled from the shock of the rebel volley. In the distance, General McClellan and his staff watched the Irish Brigade's attack. Seeing the flags fall and the Irish line halt, a young staff lieutenant cried, The day is lost, General. The Irish fly. McClellan was silent for a moment and then said, No, no, their flags are up. See, they are charging. On December 2nd, 1862, the first Irish colors of the regiment were returned to New York. Since they did not have their green flag, the soldiers of the regiment placed sprigs of boxwood in their hats. As the 69th approached the wall on Mary's Heights, a Southern Irish regiment from Georgia cheered and then mowed them down with rifle fire. Not a man reached the stone wall. The regiment almost ceased to exist, but the enemy found the body of a 69th man nearest the stone wall. Each year on St. Patrick's Day, members of the regiment wore sprigs of boxwood in commemoration of that battle. In December 2012, Alpha Company, 1st Battalion, 69th Infantry, participated in the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Fredericksburg, along with representatives of the Irish Defense Forces. 
it's honestly the Irish when they came here during after the Great Famine were not well received in this country and one of the things that came out of the Civil War and what the Irish Brigade did here in Fredericksburg in 1862 was begin to change that attitude through their sacrifice that Irishmen were giving up their lives and making great sacrifice to basically restore the nation as we knew it. These 1200 men who sacrificed everything and bought into their new country and I think it changed the course of their history. At about 4.30 in the afternoon on July 2, 1863, during the Battle of Gettysburg, Colonel Kelly, commander of the Irish Brigade, asked Father William Corby, one of the chaplains of the brigade, to give his soldiers general absolution. The interesting thing is many of the men in the Irish Brigade don't really talk about it very much because I think the events that were coming superseded that. But people who observed it were, were struck by this moment of the whole brigade kneeling down, Father Corby standing on a rock, giving the men absolution with the sounds of battle raging behind them. Dominus Noster, Jesus Christus, Vos Absolvet, Octiriate Ips. After the Civil War, Father Corby went on to become the president of Notre Dame University. While the 69th Regiment, New York State Volunteers, was engaged in the Battle of Gettysburg, one of the other regiments in our lineage, the 69th Infantry Regiment, New York State Militia, was in Pennsylvania to help stop the Confederate invasion of that state. It was recalled and sent to New York City to assist in putting down the raging draft riots. And sometimes this brought militiamen in direct conflict with other people in their own community, sometimes even their only own family members. One of the best examples of this was the use of the 69th New York to put down the draft riots of 1863, which was duty that they did not like, uh, did it uh, with reservations, but nevertheless performed their duty. Late in the afternoon of March 7, 1918, in the Rouge Bouquet sector of France, near Luneville, the enemy shelled the 69th trench position with heavy mortars. A direct hit on a dugout buried Lieutenant John Norman and 24 men of Company E. Major Donovan and members of the regiment worked through the night to rescue the trapped men. Sergeant, get your men to lift this beam. You can't go down there, Father. The whole place is going to cave in in a minute. Go on, do as he tells you. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Father. Two were saved, and the bodies of five were recovered. The rest, including Lieutenant Norman, could not be rescued. Their bodies were buried under the dirt and rubble of the collapsed dugout. The affair is commemorated in Joyce Kilmer's poem entitled The Rouge Bouquet. The poem was read for the first time at a service conducted for the men by Father Duffy on Sunday, March 17, 1918, St. Patrick's Day. Perhaps their brave young spirits hear the bugles sing. Go to sleep. Go to sleep. Slumber well where the shells screamed and fell. Let your rifles rest on the muddy floor. You will not need them anymore. Danger's past. Now at last, go to sleep. And up to heaven's doorway floats from the wood called Rouge Bouquet a delicate cloud of bugle notes that softly say, farewell, farewell. Comrades the Rouge to Bouquet you. is read at memorial services for members of the regiment, including a memorial service each year at the 69th Regiment Monument in Calvary Cemetery in Queens, New York. The first full-scale effort to recover from the Japanese some of their strongholds in the Central Pacific was the expedition to the Gilbert Islands in November 1943. 
The transport ship Calvert brought Colonel Gardner J. Conroy, commander of the 165th Regiment, the Fighting 69th, to the northernmost atoll, Macon. I'll sing a song, it won't take long, of the fighting 69. They're a band of men, brave, stout, and bold, from Ireland they came. And they held a leader to the fore, and Cartwright was his name. It was in the month of April when the boys, they sailed away. And they made a sight so glorious as they marched along Broadway. They marched right down Broadway. As the regiment assaulted, they began to receive small arms and machine gun fire from the defenders. The soldiers were surprised to discover that even though they were assaulting the beach at high tide as planned, a miscalculation of the lagoon's depth caused their landing boats to go aground. Singing here's to boys who fear no noise. We're the fighting 69. That was it. Macon was taken, and the regiment would go on to fight in Saipan and Okinawa. One of the regiment's traditions was to hold a beefsteak dinner the first Friday in November. In the 1970s, the annual beefsteak dinner was changed to the Macon Day dinner in recognition of the brave men who participated in World War II. Veterans of Macon attend the dinner each year. Oh, there's another one. Another plane just hit. <gasps> On September 11, 2001, the World Trade Center in Lower Manhattan was attacked by terrorists, killing nearly 3,000 civilians. The 69th was self-activated by its commander, Lieutenant Colonel Jeffrey Slack, and was the first military unit to arrive at Ground Zero. The world had changed forever, and new chapters were to be added to the 69th's history. I knew five people personally that I had been friends with at one point or another in my life who died in the towers uh, on September 11th. Ashes, flames, smoke, firemen, grief-stricken rescue workers. Fires were still burning at number seven. Uh, fire was still glowing in the pit at, at the site of the World Trade Center itself. It was, you know. The regiment was assigned for deployment to Iraq in March 2004 and arrived in country as part of Task Force Wolfhound in October. It successfully accomplished numerous missions along Route Irish and in Taji and other locations before returning home in September 2005. Tragically, the 69th suffered the loss of 19 of its own while in Iraq. The regiment was not deployed to Afghanistan as a unit, but its members served with pride and honor with other units on two occasions. Over 300 members of the 69th served with other units in 2007 to 2008, suffering the loss of four members. Other members were deployed again to Afghanistan in 2012 to 2013 all of whom returned safely. While not official, members of the 69th proudly flew its green flags each time. We're weekend warriors. September 11th happens and we are soldiers. Everything just changed overnight. They sent us north to an area called Taji. There were bombs buried under every road. Guys would load up their cars and just drive next to them, boom. And people were burning up alive and then you can hear them scream. It incinerated just about everybody inside. Uh, all, all told, seven soldiers were killed on that. It was just a uh, difficult moment. And at that point, we had the choice to either give up or accept the fact that we may die any minute and then go back out after the enemy and fight him and find the guys who killed our friends.
it's part of our the heritage of the 69th that is very closely tied to the Irish in New York City. Today, the, the 69th is made up of other minorities, and, and, which is part of its history also. We have a guy from Czechoslovakia, we have people from the Caribbean, uh, people from China. Give me a 203 into that BP now. And it's a very effective unit because of its diversity. People could deal with different cultures in different ways because they had the experience in dealing with different cultures. The 69th at its heart, um, it's obviously starting out as an Irish immigrant organization, is now and always has been an organization of built of immigrants. No matter where it's from, uh, they're, they're an organization of people that have, that have come from somewhere else, that, have, that are based out of New York City, um, that have come together to fight or to serve, and uh, that's, that's been the same throughout its history, whether they've been Irish immigrants in the beginning or now uh, from uh, Latin America, South America, uh, the Caribbean, wherever the immigrant population of New York City, whatever that flavor is, that's the flavor of the 69th. Great thing about the 69th is that, unlike a lot of other Army units, we still remember our past. It's on display as soon as you walk in the front doors of the Armory. It's taught to our young recruits, even though we've gone from a very Irish base to more along the lines of the ethnic base of what New York is now. We still remember where we came from. We're an immigrant infantry battalion, so to speak. We take in New York's youngest and try to make them men. One of the things that's so special about the National Guard is that we create relationships and make friendships that, that are within our community and that we can keep forever. It, it's powerful across the National Guard, but in a unit like the 69th Infantry, that has such a long and proud tradition and such a long and proud heritage, those friendships and those relationships are not only, are not only close because of our National Guard uh, bonds, but, but they really stretch through generations and allow us to reach back to, to our predecessors and channel them into everything that we do. And it makes us a very strong and unique, unique regiment. The 69th Infantry Regiment has a unique history and many traditions. And it's the history and traditions of the regiment that bond the soldiers who came before to the soldiers now serving to the soldiers who will follow in the future. The Fighting 69th. Which was greeted with a smile, singing here's to boys who fear no noise. Where the so farewell unto you, dear New York, will I ever see you once more. For it fills my heart with sorrow to leave your sylvan shore. But the country now is calling us, and we must face for. So here's to the stars and stripes, me boys, and to Ireland's lovely shore. So we gave them hearty cheers, me boys, which was greeted with a smile. Singing here's to boys who fear no noise, we're the fighting 69. So we give them hearty 